Is the United States in decline? Hello, welcome to Dangerous Policy, a channel aimed at intelligent people wanting to discuss important issues facing life and society. My name is Crispin, and today I'm responding to a question I received. Is the United States at the end of its civilization? Is it in a, a, a place of terminal decline wherein it will be replaced in the next you know, 100 years or so as a, a topic of history rather than global preeminence as it is today? Now, it's a very complicated question, and uh, in order to, to analyze this objectively, we need to set a baseline. So first of all, what is decline? Well, there are two different types of decline in the international sphere. One is absolute decline. That is your economy falters, you have a shrinking national production, you might lose territory, regions break away from you, uh, you might be subject to foreign invaders. And we can think about this very clearly if you just look at the Roman Empire. You know, had this massive expansion, reaching its zenith under the Antonine emperors, and then we sort of went into a uh, a terminal decline over the next successive centuries. And thus, it had absolute rise and absolute decline. The other form of decline is relative decline. And that is because in the international sphere, all power is zero sum. Just let, let me say that again as, as to sink that point in. In the international sphere, all power is zero sum. That is, if one power rises in relative terms, the other power, even if it is growing in absolute terms, uh, is shrinking in its importance relative to that new power. The term that was created by uh, Graham Allison around this is called the Thucydides Trap, named after uh, the historian Thucydides accounting the Peloponnesian War, who famously said that it was the rise of the power of Athens and the fear that created in Sparta that made war between the two inevitable. That is, the relative power um, relativities were shifting in such way that one country, one nation, or in this case a city-state, perceived its relative decline. And that those are two very different things. So is the United States in absolute decline? No, it isn't. Its economy has contracted during the pandemic, but it will grow again. It hasn't had a permanent shift in its, uh, in its geopolitical kind of structure in a sense that it's lost overseas territories. You know, Hawaii hasn't broken away. It hasn't lost its, its islands in the, in the Pacific. It hasn't been kicked out of, of, um, uh, of Guam. And so, you know, it's maintained its overall absolute power. What has shifted is the rapidly rising uh, powers in the developing world. Um, previously, of course, China, uh, India, uh, Brazil, and in terms of their distance in GDP against the United States, well, that is narrowing rapidly. But does that alone mean that the US is in decline? Well, it doesn't, and, and, but we can explore to what extent that argument holds merit. So first of all, at the end of the Second World War, uh, that was when the United States had the highest GDP production relative to the rest of the world in its history. Uh, Western Europe had been, of course, completely destroyed. Japan had been flattened. Uh, China had suffered immensely under decades of occupation and, and foreign rules and then it descended into civil war. Uh, only the Soviet Union had is sort of industrialized, but they themselves had lost over 20 million citizens in that conflict. The United States was the only major power, the only major belligerent, not to have been directly attacked uh, on its mainland during the context of the war. Uh, and thus, uh, it maintained its industrial base. It was strong enough to take on both fascism in Germany and uh, uh, Imperial Japan at the same time. Uh, and after the Second World War, accounted for about over a quarter of the world's GDP production, despite being only 5 or 6% of the world's population. So this was a, a massive, omnipresent power 
that despite the fact that it was a duopoly with the Soviet Union, was always the more powerful of the two and maintained uh, that economic relativity kind of benefit over the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. In fact, uh, China is far more powerful economically relative to the United States than the Soviet Union ever was, even at the height of its power. So in that sense, uh, the United States has experienced a relative economic decline because of the massive reconstruction and development of the other powers. And, and it's important also to note that there are two different types of economic recovery uh, in the post-World War II era. One is the reconstruction, you know, the massive rebuilding of all the things that had been destroyed. So it's very easy to have high levels of compounding economic growth when all you're doing is rebuilding things that had previously been lost. And in a sense that that it's not uh, the US experiencing a significant relative decline, it's just things going back to normal as uh, other nations kind of get back on track. And, and one can kind of sort of say, well, in that sense, America's relative power at the end of the Second World War was just a, 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 an accident of history and, and not really a, a part of the long running American narrative. Well, the other um, form of decline there is that uh, you have the great leveling of individual productive capacity within the other nation states. So what the Industrial Revolution had done in the 19th century was break the nexus between how much an individual could produce um, versus the total economic size of the nation. Previously to that, it was if you had the largest population in the most arable land or you had the largest economy because everyone produced roughly the same amount. Well, in the uh, Industrial Revolution, that broke that because you had the internal combustion engine, you had electricity, you had other forms of metallurgy. And that allowed uh, an individual worker in a factory to produce vastly more than sort of an artisan could in the in the Enlightenment era. And uh, that Industrial Revolution happened in the West, in Britain, in Germany, in France, and of course in the United States. And thus uh, it had a huge productive advantage over the rest of the world. Well, now uh, we're seeing that level out completely. You've got the, the Chinese, uh, the Indians, the, the other nation states, they are in rapidly industrializing, modernizing their economies. And thus each individual worker is becoming, once again, more level with its Western peers. And to put that in perspective, China has a, a population, you know, five to six times that of the United States. That means that if every individual Chinese worker produces just one fifth or a, a quarter of what an American worker produces, then the total national wealth of China is going to eclipse that of the United States. So there is a certain inevitability to that. And in that way, the United States is in a relative decline because of the great leveling in the post-industrial revolution era. Uh, the other thing that is more concerning to me is that the US does seem to be going through a unique kind of crisis of confidence in itself. Uh, you could argue that during the 60s and 70s, uh, in the great struggle with the Soviet Union, with the notable exception of Vietnam, the United States had very strong uh, belief in its own ideals, the universalism of its principles, liberty, sovereignty, the individual freedom of speech, uh, that the idea that, that a nation state could be built on something that was more than just sort of ethnic, nationalist or historical indigenous ties, but unified through a form of collective idea, i.e. anyone can be an American if they are, you know, simply adopt the same institutions, laws, principles, doctrines, uh, and, and want to be part of the American family. That, that was something that, that Americans strongly believed in. And that ideal of democracy and its, you know, exceptionalism in the world uh, gave it a great sense of unity and a national um, pride. And also the shared experience of the Second World War meant that everyone in Congress and politics, and they were all veterans of the war. Uh, and thus, you know, even if they had political differences, they had that shared national uh, experience that made them all feel like, you know, Americans. Whereas now the sense of division is, is very great. You know, people are deeply tribal. They're in their social media echo chambers. 
politics is absolutely visceral. I mean, a president has been impeached twice uh, and, you know, all basically along party lines. Uh, the uh, people who are in sort of Republican states uh, feel that the Democrats are absolutely, you know, diabolical and vice versa. Uh, and so there is a deep sense of cultural division. And add to that uh, a sort of outsourcing of power and information control to big tech companies uh, and a sense that, you know, Americans are not unified as Americans. That's deeply concerning. And that can actually lead to a real decline, not this relative decline, because if you have civil conflict, civil strife, things that spin out of control, uh, then you know that that is the inevitable consequence. The United States uh, used to say that, uh, and not the United States itself, but many Americans would say that China was on the brink of collapse. There was always this belief that uh, you would have a economic ceiling in China wherein you need to democratize, have open systems of government, independent judiciary, accountability, um, independent public service, in order to have the transparency necessary to create a modern market open economy with the rapid movement of capital and investment. Well, that was a, a belief that has been proven totally false. China has continued to modernize at the same time as becoming more authoritarian. Uh, but at the same time, there was a belief that Western liberal democracy uh, and in particular American style democracy was a precondition for a successful um, liberal state. And uh, they would have said, well, look, if, if, Amer if the Chinese Communist Party continues to try and repress the people and create a pressure cooker environment where people have this natural yearning for freedom and liberty and democracy and rights and all of these sorts of stuff, um, but the Chinese Communist Party was clinging to power, well, that could create a pressure cooker in such a way that the Chinese uh, state you know, begins to dissolve. Well, if you were to ask the average American now, which is more likely, civil conflict in China or civil conflict in the United States, I'm sure the polling is massively different given what's going on right now in the United States. Uh, in that sense, I am deeply worried that, that American cultural confidence is in crisis, uh, that the national stories and things that are being told, things that are coming out of Disney, out of Hollywood, they're all pretty re regressive, to be frank. There's not really, you know, the, the, the next Shakespeare, the next Michelangelo, uh, it's, it's very hard to imagine that coming out of the, the cultural zeitgeist of the United States today, that the genius is kind of repressed. There's a strong cancel culture, a strong culture of doxing and conformity, of censorship, uh, things that are totally anti-American in their own right, which festers resentment across great swathes of the American community. And that thus those tribal divisions are just getting worse and worse. Uh, and as such, that it, it, we aren't in a stage of decline yet. But those signs are there. And without a course correction, without a shared national experience that brings all Americans together, without leadership that is genuinely non-divisive, uh, without uh, you know, an, a, a degree of empathy with the people that voted for Trump on the, and the thing on people that are you know, struggling Democrats in, in certain cult, you know, coastal areas, unless they can breach that divide, uh, then there will be a decline. I mean, that's just a the reality, if they continue to, to tighten that knot eventually, as, as Khrushchev once said, uh, they'll cut that knot. But at the moment, uh, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. I mean, militarily, it spends vastly more than the next you know, 10 countries combined uh, on its military forces, and, and its military is highly effective. It's been engaged in various combat theatres throughout the world. Uh, it is, maintains a high level of readiness. There's a great deal of research and development that continues to push the envelope on what's possible in the military sphere. And thus, it's not something that's sort of resting on its laurels. There's a constant degree of self-evaluation. Uh, the education level of senior uh, military officers in the United States is, is quite admirable. I mean, I, I, I contrast this with Australia with some degree of dismay, where um, you know the vast majority of of senior military officers in the U.S. system have advanced degrees, uh, whereas uh, you know in Australia, yes, there is a, a good culture of of, um, of mateship and camaraderie and combat effectiveness and and uh, 
and hardship and endurance and all of the things that we would admire in a, in a good soldier, uh, but intellectual prowess isn't in that same category of virtue that is the case in the United States. And thus, uh, it, w- w- I think we do see a, 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 not a stagnation, but relative to the United States, uh, um, Australia's military culture isn't as robust and dynamic. So the US has those things that are in its advantage. Uh, the US continues to attract the best and brightest from around the world. Yes, other universities are shooting up through the rankings worldwide. Um, but, you know, the American Ivy League still attracts, uh, you know, the greatest talent. Uh, the U.S. is very effective at maintaining its alliances uh, around the world. Even you know, for all the criticism of Trump, uh, Trump did actually encourage NATO to increase its defense expenditure and take more control over its own affairs, which the Europeans absolutely need to do. Uh, meanwhile, the United States is deepening its relations with Japan, Taiwan, uh, India, Australia, uh, and uh, and building those relationships in a way that adds uh, material advantage to to the United States in its upcoming struggles with uh, with with the rising China. So in that sense, I don't think like on balance, the, the United States is not in decline. Well, we're not seeing sort of end of empire Roman style decline in the way that uh, would would precipitate the end, if you like, of American hegemony in the world. Nonetheless, the universalization of American ideas uh, is almost fatally wounded. Uh, For example, the, the idea that everybody yearns for freedom. It's something that that Americans believe in. And in fact, I'll, I'll do a whole video on that, so I won't, I won't speak about that now. But the idea that, that liberal democracy is required for an advanced economy, that's no longer the case. Uh, the idea that uh, authoritarian governments um, can't maintain legitimacy with their own people, that's not the case. Uh, the idea that uh, American... Um, leadership once the Soviet Union collapsed and the discrediting of of Stalinist kind of Marxism, Bolshevism, uh, meant that that the Washington consensus was the only thing left standing and thus was the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama infamously said. Uh, that's, of course, been blown out of the water. Uh, the resurgence of great power competition has become, you know, the front and center of American strategic interest. Uh, and the limitations of what America could get embroiled in abroad. I mean, one of the things that happened over the last 40 years in terms of America's m- horrible foreign policy misadventures like the Iraq War and, and others, uh, Libya, is because America had the luxury to do those things. You, you, you don't make those mistakes as easily if you have to focus laser-like on a narrow range of strategic interests because they're the only things that you can do. And so with the rise of China and America's reorientation towards meeting that challenge, it's less likely America will get involved in these kinds of issues around the world. And that you know, is, is no doubt a positive thing, but is also an indicator of relative decline because it no longer has the luxury to do all these things everywhere like it once did. Uh, and that's one of the great challenges for the American um, force over the next few decades is that you know America has a huge presence in Europe uh, and it has a huge presence in the Middle East and it has a huge presence in Asia and it doesn't have the power to do everything everywhere because of the changing power relativities. Um, but until such time as American tribalism gets so bad that we start to see succession of American states and, and genuine civil conflict, uh, and we are on that path, but we're not there yet. Until that happens, uh, America is not in true decline. It does need a massive rejuvenation. It does need a unifying national story. Uh, uh, the differences between rich and poor in the United States is becoming diabolically bad. Uh, the social mobility is really undermining the American dream. There's a, there's a crisis of confidence in American uh, elections and American political system. So for all of those reasons, there are really worrying things, regression of the culture, like I said. But uh, these are challenging problems that over a long period of time can be resolved. When I think of the history of the Byzantine Empire, for example, uh, which stretched for a thousand years beyond the fall of the Western half of the Roman Empire, 
you know, you had these huge crises over many centuries, such as, uh, you know, the iconoclasts and and all of that, Uh, things that would have at the time seemed like the end of of Byzantium, but it wasn't. Uh, It wasn't until the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 that, that there was a clear absolute decline when Byzantium lost Anatolia to the Seljuk Turks and then the, the absolute crisis of the Fourth Crusade when the Venetians uh, you know, took, took Constantinople uh, and then they just are limping on after that until the final conquest in 1453 by, by, by the Sultan. Uh, there, there are those clear markers, um, but there were along that great journey massive crises within the culture, within the society, within the, the, the tribalism of, of, of the different groups, the, the greens and the blues, uh, that would have seemed at the time to be indicators of decline. I think we're seeing a lot of those parallels in the United States. The United States is going through a period of great national crisis, but we're not at the stage where we go, all right, rest in peace, the United States. Uh, we're definitely not there yet. Uh, that's my view. It's it's a very kind of complicated story. There's a lot to unpack in what I've just said there. Uh, if you have commentary on this, please do leave it down below because we'll do more videos on this. There's all these different threads we could make whole videos about. Uh, so I'm really interested in your view. Uh, if you haven't already, please like and definitely subscribe. Subscribing is the best thing you can do for the channel. Share this video if you found it uh, useful for others. And I will see you next time. Thank you.